So today's Top Solid webinar entitled How to Manage Your Manufacturing Experience with Top Solid 7. Today what I wanted to do was I wanted to talk a little bit about manufacturing kind of as the big picture to begin with and kind of set a foundation of why Top Solid even exists. So I made up some corny slides. If uh, some of you have watched some of my other webinars in the past, you know I'm a big fan of corny slides. So I had this manufacturing bubble. And the whole idea behind this is to kind of talk about what exists in the world of manufacturing. And for example, I've broken it into four main sections. One called engineering, another one called machining, another one called tool and die, and yet another one that deals with sheet metal manufacturing. On the engineering side, there is three main sectors that exist out there. One is mechanical engineering, the other one is product development, and the last one is a special one for the woodworking industry that uh, is focused on companies that design furniture or cabinets or basically anything made out of wood. Mechanical engineering, we all know what that is, and product development type of engineering, we all know what that is. On the machining side, it's broken into a few subsectors. You have 2D machining, 3D milling, 4D milling, 5D milling, turning, mill turn, and of course, wire EDM. On the tool and die side, you have to deal with corn cavity splits. You have to deal with mold design. You have to deal with strip design and then the final progressive die design. And in manufacturing product dies and molds, you of course have to be able to deal with electro design. And finally on the sheet metal side, you have to deal with programming laser machines, punch machines, and deal with the nesting that goes within that specific manufacturing process. In all, manufacturing is pretty intense. There's a lot going on. Now, there is a step more that exists in the manufacturing process, and that, of course, has to do with simulation. Now, everywhere we see these little blue and we'll call them tan buttons, this could be material simulation, it could be finite element analysis simulation, it could be mechanical simulation. But all of these various products and subsectors, if you will, all have simulation behind them. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of walk through the manufacturing process a little bit. So let's pretend for a while that we are going to manufacture a product. I don't even care what the product is. To begin with, we're going to go to engineering, right? Our engineering team is going to be divided by two. We're going to do a mechanical sample and a product development sample in this case. On the engineering side, we're going to start with the mechanical design. And here we're using a product, who knows? And we're designing this mechanical product. This could be a special machine design. It could be a fixture. Who knows? Once the design is done, we're sending it up to our 2D machining package because we need to prep the material for machining. Ultimately, though, it'll wind up on our 5-axis mill. At the same time, we're doing some product development for an injection molded product. So our product developer is designing up the part. Once his part is ready, he sends it off to the designer dealing with the mold. Now that designer is going to go ahead and do our cork and cavity split and then work on that complete mold design. Now once that mold design is to a certain level, we can send aspects of it over to be machined. However, some portions of the mold are not directly machinable, so we need to build electrodes for it. Once those electrodes are designed, those get sent over to be machined. Now, in this case, we're gonna pretend that our programmer driving the 3D programming, found a mistake in the design. So what he does is he notifies the mold designer, who in turn notifies, notifies pardon me, the product developer, who in turn notifies the project lead on this engineering project. Basically, what I'm trying to outline here is the chaos that is manufacturing. We have all of these different processes happening all over the place, and it is quite chaotic. To make things worse, let's talk about products specifically. A lot of companies out there use a different product for mechanical design than they do for product development. If they're in the woodworking industry, they use a third product as well for designing woodworking applications. On the machining side, some products use yet another product for 2D, 3D. Maybe they use a special product for mill turn and turn, another special product for 5-axis because their 2D, 3D product just doesn't do it well, and of course their 5D product doesn't do the 2D, 3D well, right? And then they find another specialty product to drive their wire EDM. If again, this is the same big manufacturing company or this is going through different manufacturers to get there, on the tool and die side, we use a specialty product for the mold and die, right? 
maybe there's a different product for progressive dies from the molds. If you're driving sheet metal and you're designing sheet metal and programming laser and punch machines, you have yet another product. This is a huge, huge problem that exists in the world of manufacturing. You have all these different products. Now, imagine the problem that is created when you try to communicate between all of these different products. What happens when that design change comes through? How do you push it through properly and make sure that everyone involved in this project is able to get that latest version of data? There's another big problem, and I think this is the problem that I want to focus on this, uh, this time around. And that problem is a financial problem. I'm going to pretend all those products I mentioned, they're all different products. I'm not going to pick on our competitors here. I don't think that's important. I think you guys get what I'm about to say. Every product out there has an annual maintenance contract. So all these fictional products that I talked about, product A, B, C, and so on, I've assigned a fictional price to. Now, if you want to play this game at home, you know what you're paying on maintenance. Fill in the numbers yourself. For that first mechanical product, we used products A, D, and F. So we're going to add that up in a second. But in the same project, we also used products B, H, and D. If we add the maintenance contracts together for each of these, for those single users, for example, you're talking about $12,500 spent annually on software. And that's a lot of money for a single platform. Now, you're spending this not just to one place, but to three, four different companies. And the problem there is, you know, product A maybe does the release in January, product B does their release in April, product C does it in February, who knows? And to get them all to communicate together, you have to postpone getting the latest versions of software until all of those versions are up to date. Another huge problem. Thankfully, there's a solution to that problem. And that solution is, of course, top solid. Top Solid was written from the ground up to be a manufacturing solution. So in the case where you're using four or five different products to get your manufacturing process complete and spending a lot of money maintaining and training on multiple platforms, you could be saving money by using a simple platform, and that is the Top Solid platform. Remember, Top Solid is a PDM-based CAD CAM solution, working with a solution that is properly and automatically managed can change everything from your bottom line through your manufacturing process. Okay, so that's my little portion of my PowerPoint. Now we're going to go ahead and play around inside of Top Solid. And all I'm going to do here today is kind of play through an entire process. Okay, so I'm going to go into Top Solid and in my project here, and I'll tell you what, we'll even start a new project. So I'll start a new project here and I'll call this webinar. Why not? Oops, pardon me. It would help to actually hit the new project button. I'll call this webinar. And now it's going to build the webinar project for me and then we're going to open the webinar project and we're going to design a simple widget. Okay, here's our webinar project. I'm going to open it. Here's the project and let's start by defining a part. Now in this case I am going to design a part. I'm going to take the part and I'm going to manufacture the part. And we're just going to walk through in that same platform all the steps needed to do the job. So what is this part going to be called? It's going to be called a bracket. Why not? I'm going to start by, oh, you know what? We're not even going to create a sketch. I'll do it differently. I'm going to start with a primitive. And in fact, I want my primitive to be four by three. That's perfect. And maybe we're going to make it, oh, let's say three inches tall. I like that. And instead of working with the primitive now, I'm going to go ahead and trim away some material because I'm going to make this little hook or this little latch, if you will, that will be manufactured on a mill turret machine. To begin with, I want to go and find a specific plane and I want to draw on my XZ plane. So I'm going to create a sketch right on XZ. Now, when I look straight at this, my plane is oriented this way. Maybe you want to change it. Some of the freedom you have in Top Solid is amazing. I can just go and change the orientation of any frame or any plane. It's kind of fun. Now here I'm going to go to contour. I'm going to start up here, come over some distance, down, over. We'll go to a tangent dark mode like so. We'll go up and over and this will be my profile. Next I want this to be perpendicular so I'm just going to right click on the point and one of the things that I want you to really pay attention to as I'm working is I'm not clicking on a lot of icons. I'm just filling out information 
I'm selecting objects, I'm right-clicking on those objects, and the software is interpreting them correctly for me. Maybe, for example, I want this to be an eighth inch bigger per side. Maybe I want this, from this point to here, to be a specific value. We'll say it's two and an eighth. Why not? Maybe I want this to be a specific value as well. I want this to be five eighths. Next, I'm gonna drag this up a little bit, and I want here from that line to there to be also a specific value of two and a quarter and so on. You guys are getting the idea. I'm just capturing the exact design intent that I'm looking for. We'll say that's 30 degrees. And then just for fun, I'm gonna go right on this point right here, right click and add a fillet. And that fillet is gonna be an eighth of an inch. Next, what I'm gonna do is trim by profile. In fact, I just wanna trim that shape by that profile. This is gonna give me my rough turned part. Perfect. Next, I'm gonna create a sketch right on this face look straight at it, and I'm gonna build a simple rectangle. I'm gonna start my rectangle right there and I'll come down to some distance there. I don't care about that size per se. I want it to be related to that point and related to that edge. Finally, I wanna add a dimension from here to here. And maybe this is gonna be 3 eighths of an inch. I'm making this sketch because I'm simply going to cut away the material I don't want to use. Maybe I want it to always go through, so I'll set that condition that captures my design intent perfectly. Next, maybe I want to take that same cut and repeat it to the other side. Nice and simple, I'm going to go ahead and create a symmetrical pattern. That pattern will be about our XZ plane. Brilliant. And finally, I'm going to add a fillet down here. I want to fill it right there. It's going to be an eighth of an inch there and there. Last thing I'm gonna do is add a couple of drillings. And I'm just gonna do this in a couple of different ways. The first way is I'm gonna right click on the face. I'm gonna pick hole. And this hole, I want it to be through and I want it to be 5 eighths of an inch. Yeah, let's make it 3 quarters. I like that better. Perfect. Next, I wanna put some counterboard holes in on this, but I wanna do this quickly and efficiently. So I'm gonna use what's called a sketch pattern to do it. I'm gonna start by going to my point command, and then I'm gonna turn on dynamic double symmetry. So you can see here, I'm creating four points at once, which is kind of cool. I'll turn that double symmetry off, and I'm gonna add some simple dimensions. I want from here to here to be one inch, perfect. And maybe from here to here, we want it to be an inch and a quarter. Awesome. Finally, what I'm gonna do is create a drilling group out of this. And maybe for this case, I'll use my counterboard command. Maybe that diameter of that is good, and maybe the through hole is going to be, uh, pardon me, 5 sixteenths, perfect. And now I have everything done in my design that I wanted to do. So at this point, I'm gonna save that design. I'm also going to check it in, and this is using the PDM now within Top Solid 7. And I'm gonna say that the initial design is complete, perfect. Next, I wanna start processing this design. And this is where a lot of other softwares would say, okay, you're gonna export this as a Parasolidus step or an IGES or something like that so that we can bring it into product you know, A, B, or C, CAM solution that we're using. Well, thankfully, Top Solid, as I said, is a pure manufacturing solution. So we do everything inside of one platform. Here, what I'm gonna do is start by going to my machine part setup document. Now, under machine part setup, I'm going to tell the software what the part to machine is, as well as what the stock condition is. For example, I'm gonna machine this out of a piece of bar stock. If I let it shrink wrap around there, it's gonna come up as a size of four and a half inches in diameter, and that's exactly what that radius is there. But I wanna be able to turn that down, so I'm gonna say it's four inches, 625. Next, I'm gonna add a little material back here, and a little bit up here as well, so I have something to turn. I'll say okay and okay, and now Top Solid knows what the part to cut is and it knows what the stock condition is. Next, I'm gonna go to my machining folder and make a new machining. Now, I could have had a template prepared for you guys, and that template could have been the machine I wanna run on, it could have had fixturing and tooling and all sorts of fun things already defined, but in this case, what I'd rather do is I'd rather work a little bit more dynamically. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick the machine to start with that I wanna work with. And I'll search through my library of standard machines. This all ships with the software, which is brilliant. And I'm gonna look for my Mori Seiki. I'm gonna use the Mori MT2500. 
This is a B-axis twin turret machine, and what that means is this upper turret rotates about B, and it's got a lower turret on it. That's what the twin channel means. In this case, I don't know that I'm going to do much with the twin channel, at least not today. Uh, I'm going to do most of my operations with the upper turret. I'm going to start by loading my part to machine into a cam. And here I'm just using the dynamic assembly nature of top solid to make this easy. So I'm going to say that cylinder goes to that cylinder. And I'm going to rotate this around and say that flat face goes to my collet face. And yes, I know it's the wrong size collet, but that's okay. I forgive myself this time. And I'm going to say that's going to be two inches out because I want to make sure it's sticking away from my spindle just a little bit. Last thing I want to do is I want to take that flat face there and I want to orient it off the Y axis. Perfect. This way, if I look at this in a turning view, I can see the profile brilliantly. I'm going to position that. It's on the main spindle and I'm ready to go. Now, how do you start programming a part like this inside of Top Solid? Well, just like you saw me do in design, everything in Top Solid is a right click away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this face, I'm going to hold the Alt key and select this face. That's telling Top Solid what the start and end condition is going to be. Then I'm going to right mouse button click and under turning, I'm going to choose roughing. Now to begin with, we need to go and find a tool or create a tool. I'm just going to create a tool for today's sample. I'm going to go up here, go to my templates, and I'm going to say that I want a rhombic or 80 degree tool. I'm going to say that the corner radius is 031. Perfect. And I'll validate. Now there's my tool. But if you notice, my tool is being shown with my BXS head, which is kind of cool, so I can see if I can reach this stuff. First, notice we're checking the angle of the insert. So we're only machining as far as this tool can actually reach, which is kind of awesome. Notice also it's stopping before the collision which is also really cool, okay? And it's checking the collision based on the real tool, not just the nose radius. Now, in this case, to really use this machine right, what I want to do is I want to set the B-axis angle to be minus 45. So I'm going to go add a new angular solution. I'm going to go up here and say minus 45. And you'll notice out here that the B-head just rotated 45 degrees. This way I know I've set the right thing. Next, if we zoom up on all of this, you can see, let me turn off the, uh, the head for a moment, you can see that now we can reach everywhere. Now, at this point, I also want to stop and talk about the complexity of what we're doing. Turning by its nature is relatively simple. The actual toolpath itself, no big deal. What makes turning a challenge is tooling, and more importantly, making sure you're passing the correct driven point of the tool. So here I want to pause and talk about that for a moment. So I'm going to go here to my gauges. And I'm going to talk about driven points. I'm going to duplicate this one just so that I can talk about the points freely. Now, if I zoom up, you can see my cursor is attached to the tangency of that nose radius, which is no good. In all reality, it's driven off of that point there, but the point has been static. We want to go off the orthogonal point or the rotated point. So I can say make gauge in position, and then I can select the right point there. And now if I zoom way up, you can see I'm driving by that correct orthogonal point. And just to be sure everyone understands what I'm uh, meaning, I'm going to zoom up on here and draw it. I want to touch off there in Z. I want to touch off here in X. And that gives me that orthogonal point. What's cool about this little command is it doesn't matter what angle you set the B axis to now, you can always get the good orthogonal point. Next, let's talk cutting conditions. Maybe here I'm going to work at 250 surface feet. Maybe I want a 4,000 chip load. Maybe I'm going to use jet, and I'm going to use constant surface feet with a max RPM, in this case, of 2,000. This way I've set everything. We're good to go. The last thing maybe I'm going to set on this operation, I'll just do it out here. I'm going to leave maybe 20 thousandths of stock, and maybe here I want to take 100 thousandths depth of cut. Perfect. And I'll go ahead and green check mark. Now, if I simulate this, you'll see the B-axis come in, and it's going to come in, and it's going to do its thing. And again, that tool is stopping long before we hit that chuck, which is awesome. Next thing I want to do is I want to finish this, because there's only a little bit of turning on this part. I'm just using this machine for its versatility, so I'm going to, again, select those same faces. I'm going to right-click, go to finishing. I'm going to use the same tool, in fact, and I want to use the same angular solution, so I'm going to drag and drop to there, and we're done. Maybe the only thing I want to do is I want to extend my lead out over here. So I can come over here to lead in lead out, and I'm going to say lead out overcut, and I'm going to set that to 
and you can see it just extended out here. One of the cool factors of top solid cam is in the two and a half axis world for turning or milling, everything you do dynamically updates. Let's click OK. So now our turning's done. Awesome. Now we have a little bit of milling to do, right? So if I rotate this, you can see there's still material here on the sides. So let's work on processing the milling portion of this. Now, how does that work? Well, again, some companies, believe it or not, they switch to a different solution to drive the milling portion because the turning software they have can't drive milling on these types of machines or vice versa. Again, the big thing I want you all to take away from this is Top Solid is a complete solution. You can do everything from A to Z within it. The best part about it, it's the same interface from A to Z. It's the same learnability from A to Z. This also, because of this, overall lowers cost of ownership of this. And let's go on record saying that as well. Top Solid is a perpetual license. You're actually buying the software. It's not a rent-only application. Okay, let's do the milling. I'm going to select that face, right-click, and go to end milling. When I do, the software finds the remaining area to machine. I'm going to start by building a tool. I'm going to use a radius mill in this case. And in this case, it's going to be an eighth inch radius. Maybe it's a three quarter inch end mill. Maybe overall it's three and a half inches long. And maybe here it's got, I don't know, inch and three quarters of flute. Perfect. If I rotate this around, I can see if that's actually got the reach. That's one of the cool things you can do here. Now well, that'll be okay. Maybe we need a little bit more flute. So we'll say it's two inches worth of flute. Yep, I like that. That's better. You can go to here, you can set the holder as you want. Maybe it's an inch 875, and maybe it's an extension holder, so it's three inches long. Cool. You can even go to your assembly level here and play with the gauge distance, and this is how far that tool is sticking out by default. Perfect. Now, I'm going to click OK. It's going to load that tool, and again, it's going to create that machining. And we get to see that machining instantly, which is cool. Now, in this case, again, I'm going to go ahead and set some cutting conditions as well. Maybe this time I would rather work in RPM mode, so I'm going to say I'm running this at 4,500 RPM and at 10,000 chip load. Okay, 135 inches a minute. Great. We'll go to jet coolant again. Next, what I want to do is I want to optimize this. I'm going to leave it at the 70% step over. We're just cutting aluminum, we'll say. That's fine. But maybe our depth of cut is a bit much, so I want this to be 3 eighths. Maybe I only want to use, or I want no skim pass there. And then maybe stock to leave on the floor, on the walls, on islands. I want to leave all 10 thousandths. Now you can see that tool path. It's okay. There's nothing really wrong with it. But if you look, there's a lot wrong with it. Because here we had done the turning, which means there's a lot of ear cutting up here, right? Well, wouldn't it be cooler if the software you used was smart enough to know that? And here I just activated an optimization called Z-Path Stock Fitting, which now ensures that we're only cutting where there's physically material at every depth of cut. That simplifies your life a ton. Now, let's say OK to this and see what the result looks like. So again, we'll turn on the simulation. Maybe we'll pull this down a little bit. And here you can see everything is working beautifully. You can see the simulation. You can see the motion of the cut. Everything looks nice. Now, maybe we want to try doing this a different way. There is, by the way, an over-travel alarm right here. That's what those dots mean. If I click on this and I go to information, I go to strokes, it's telling me that I've over-traveled my x-axis. Well, cool. How do I solve that? Well, the way you solve that is to use the c-axis, right? If you're a military person, you understand what I mean. However, again, the problem with most technologies on the marketplace today is the fact that they do not pay attention to the type of machine you're on. Top Solid does, okay? Instead of making you delete toolpath and go find a special mill turn function, watch. I'm going to go and edit my facing. I'm going to simply come down to this button, which is called multi-axis. The software has determined, hey, this machine can actually do more, so this button is available. I'm going to activate it. It's in four-axis axial. I'd really like to use cutter comp while I'm doing this, so I'm going to transform from milling to turning, which is basically meaning we are going to use polar coordinate machining. When I use polar coordinates on a Moriseki machine, if I don't initialize the C-axis back to zero, well, it doesn't like us. So now I've done that. What does this all mean? Let's watch the simulation. First of all, once the calculation is done, notice, by the way, the G-code is already up to date with my C-axis stuff. All of that's being done in real time. Now let's watch the simulation. 
Again, B is going to rotate. That's not the exciting part. The exciting part's coming. Here, you're seeing the C axis move. So instead of having to delete the toolpath and start over, all I did was activate a new option. Think about that for simplicity. Nice. Next, I want to finish this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and simply select the face to machine and go to side milling. Again, same thing. Soft refines all the area to machine. We're going to do this maybe at a quarter inch depth of cut. Why not? The other thing that I want to do in this case is I want to take multiple radial passes. So I'm going to ask the software for like eight radial passes. Now, the problem with this is again, look at all those extra passes it's taking and that's not at all what we wanted. So why don't we turn on that Z-Pass stock fitting again? And now notice it's trimmed up that tool path to only where there's material. And I'm getting to machine the floor and the walls in a logical way without having to overthink everything. Now my lead-in lead-outs seem a bit much, so why don't we play with those a little bit? 100 thousandths is enough. Maybe we don't need quite 90 degrees. How about 45 degrees? That looks better. Now if your machine can handle it, we can do one further, which is to optimize all of those rapids as well. Notice now that all those rapids are only picking up as high as they need to to get to exactly where the next cut is. That's extremely optimized tool path without having to, again, overthink things. Lastly, I'm going to turn on that C-axis again because I know we need to. So I'm just going to go right to it, activate transformation mode, initialize to zero, and we're done. Think about that. Think about the fact that I designed this part in one solution. Oh, let me turn on the machine. Okay, and then I loaded it into the machining environment. We're programming a really complex machine without thinking hard to get there. We're doing all of the programming on there with just a few simple clicks of the mouse, and we're ready to post-process and run these first operations. Now, I know you're thinking we're not done yet because we still have to machine these sidewalls. Well, cool. What about the drag and drop ability of Windows? Wouldn't it be cool if we had that in machining? So I'm going to hold this toolpath and control drag and drop it onto this face and watch what happens. It automatically adapts itself to that geometry. In this case, it's not a critical face, so I'm letting it go right to size with that. Maybe here for the path to leave on the floor, I'm going to say minus 0.15 so that we go beyond the radius of my cutter, right? And I'm done. And again, simple Windows drag and drop technology. Cool. Let's drill a hole really fast. So I'll go here to drilling, hole machining. You can see it finds the orientation automatically. It just needs a tool. So I'm just going to load a tool. You could, of course, center drill this first or tip drill this first. At this point, I think you guys get the idea. The idea is top solid is extremely powerful. It gets the job done without you having to overthink things. Brilliant. Okay, the last thing I'm going to do. We're going to talk design changes. So I'm going to save this all. Our machining's done. You know what? I should probably name this the same thing. Let's call it bracket. And we'll call this op1 because really that's what it is. And I'm going to save it. And finally, I'm going to check that in. And I'm going to say op1 complete. Perfect. That's checked in. My machine part setup document's checked in. We're going to finish this thought by going back and playing with the design change. Again, I had mentioned briefly at the beginning of my presentation that Top Solid is a PDM-based solution, so we're tracking both major and minor revisions automatically for you. At this point, we're at minor version zero of major version A. I'm going to make a design change, and it's just going to be a silly design change. I'm going to double-click on this main feature, and I'm going to say, you know what? This is meant to be 2.25. Cool. So that part got longer. Awesome. Maybe this is going to be 25 degrees. Brilliant. Double click to hide. I'm going to save. Now notice when I save, and I'm going to zoom up for this, it put a symbol around the cam file and around my machine part setup file. Those symbols are telling you as the operator saying, hey, these documents are out of date. They need to be updated. Imagine it wasn't just me programming the part, but maybe I'm the designer and I have a programmer. That programmer just got notified that there's a revision coming his way, that he's got to regenerate his stuff. That's awesome. That's ensuring that that manufacturing process is maintained always to the latest version 
of data. And it's being done automatically because human beings make mistakes. Software, however, can ensure the process is maintained. How do we update this? It's simple. Just open them. That one's regenerated. Let me go to machining here. That one's regenerated. I just have to recalculate the toolpath. When it comes to CAM, we don't auto-recalculate the toolpath. It's up to you to choose to do that. So here, that design change has been pushed through. Everything is regenerating, and everything is updating. Now, this was a dink little part, but the idea in today's presentation was to show you, A, how, how to use an integrated CAD CAM solution, and B, talk a little bit about the value of using an integrated CAD CAM solution. So hopefully I was able to achieve both of those within this presentation. With that, that brings me to the end of this webinar. Again, I'm trying to keep these webinars short and to the point, keeping uh, everyone's valuable time in mind. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, I can see if there's any questions opened up here. Let's see. So let's see, we have a couple of questions. What happened if you want to mill with the C-axis locked? That was from Gabriella. Um, so you just want to do XY machining? For example, C-axis on one side of the part, then flip C-180. Oh, I see. Okay. So if you want to do positional milling on one side and then do the other. Let's have a quick look. I'm going to just take that milling and I'm going to deactivate it. Let's say we wanted to machine this a different way. So we want to do positional milling instead. Watch, if I select that face and go to end milling this way, it's going to position the part in lock C. So we've rotated, we've locked, and we've done our machining. And if I turn this on, you'll see it's positioning both axes, the spindle stays vertical, and away you go. And like you saw with the side milling, to do the opposite side, it's easy. You just drag and drop. Once you start and get used to drag and drop in top solid, you will miss it in any other application that you use. So here we've done more of a positional milling approach. Let's see, are there any other questions in this list before I call this done? So let's see, Mike has a question of what about the tool in an axial direction as before? So that was the way it was by default originally. So if I disable that, go back to this, and enable. If I just turn off the C-axis, so I'm going to uncheck that, now we're back to straight XY machining. I see a list, or I see a question from, uh, from Mike Godfrey, I think it is. Uh, wire EDM, yes, we have a full Wire EDM package. Perhaps what I should do is plan a Wire EDM webinar as our next webinar, because uh, that's uh, a, a big, long topic all to itself. Let me see. Is there any other questions that I'm missing? Ah, let's do that. That's a good idea. So let's go back to here. That's doing the facing that way. I'm going to go and activate these last two, or these last operations here. I'm going to enable them. I'm going to delete these, and let's finish on one final step, which I should have done to begin with. Shame on me. Setup sheets. So let's update the toolpath, and let's make a final setup sheet. Here we go. So we have our main toolpaths. I'm going to right-click on the part up here and go to a drafting document. Normally, drafting documents are for making drawings, right? Well, in this case, we're abusing that functionality to make setup sheets for manufacturing. So here you go. This is first showing you the tool. It's showing you who made it. It's showing you fees and speeds used. This is showing a picture of the updated stock with the toolpath, which is kind of cool. And that's per operation, of course. There's the finished toolpath. And if you notice down here, it made a multi-page setup sheet for us. Think about how brilliant that would be to be able to just shoot that out to the floor so that everyone in the process knows exactly what's going to happen from operation to operation. You can also have any of the revisions here indicated in the setup sheet so that you know that this is major version A, minor version 3, for example. It's just a, a choice. 
Okay. Well, I think that does it for today. I want to take this moment to uh, thank everyone that showed up for today's webinar. Hopefully you were able to learn something new about Top Solid that you didn't know about before. If any of you have any uh, in-depth questions, feel free to reach out to any of us on the team here, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions for you. I wish you all a pleasant day.